Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is... Yeah, the yeah, yeah, show. yeah, listen, that's Schnapp, that's Christian Harloff, <laughs> I'm John Campia. It's Star Wars Day, Star Wars has come out, we're going to talk about Star Wars. Yes, the Rogue One trailer dropped this morning, I waited three freaking hours because these bozos wanted to say, no, let's do a reaction to 930, like, ah, okay, so we waited, we watched it, hi everybody. Yeah, so Schnapp, you saw the Star Wars trailer, what do you think? It was all right, I guess. No, I loved it. I was going to play it off. Um, I thought it was great. And you know, to be honest, I think this is my favorite Star Wars trailer, uh, Rogue One trailer that I've seen yet since the original, the alarm right. one or whatever. Oh, that was so great. The yeah. teaser trailer. I, I really like this because you really get into the storyline. You know, I mean, we knew that there's the Death Star and they're assembling a team of people to get the plans. We already knew that because we all saw Star Wars A New Hope like more than 30 years ago. So <laughs> we kind of knew that there were a, a bunch of people who stole these plans. We're getting that story now, but I really liked the back and forth that we saw with Mads Mikkelsen. And I'm really excited to see how this entire story plays out now. I mean, it's it's one thing to know how it all ends because we know what happens to the Death Star. But it's kind of, to me, it's really intriguing to see what happens with that. What do you think, Christian? I loved it. I mean, listen, we... <laughs> we, uh, we we all held out. It was very, very hard to do, but we did. And by the way, our reaction review is up on the channel right now if, if you want to watch it. But we uh, looked at what it did really well. Is we knew that once we got to October, they were going to release a trailer. We didn't know we were going to this early. It was cool that they released it, but it set the tone. It set the story. And it set Jin Erso in a different light mm. because yeah, no, it, totally did. Because totally did. in the in the other trailers, just like she's just like I rebel, and she's just kind of this hard nosed, and you're like, oh, well, who is she? And then there's this message of hope. This is message that she wants to find her dad. There was all these things that she wanted to do, and and you could see it in her face. And it's like these, she did well. What Kristen Stewart did terribly in Snow White was that inspirational <laughs> speech where everyone's like, yes, let's do, it, let's let's go. And obviously that one, you only needed well, there's three shots of Vader in the trailer, but there's that one shot to where he just zips out with on purpose yeah, yeah. and then you with purpose and you have him out there and him and Mickelson or Krennic are having this one-on-one -on -one, this conversation the it's the the main star of this trailer to me was the Death Star right the Death Star was mm. absolutely the star because you see it kind of looming in the background it's the birth it's like it's 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 Tyson's moment of how it's just showing the dominance of what it can do and and showing that th what it's capable of doing and knowing that her father is indeed part of this whole thing so I loved it I can't wait for us to really go in depth a little bit more on Jedi Council today about it but I really liked what I saw I don't even know where to begin yeah I don't even know where to begin I absolutely loved this trailer. Um, and you know, it's funny because, like I said, we, we held off watching it for a few hours because we were gonna all watch it together. And I was just getting so frustrated reading all these tweets from all you guys saying, oh my God, it's so good. And it's like, okay, okay, okay. So I figured it'll, it'll be all right, it'll be good. I'm sure it'll be good. I loved it because one of the lingering questions I've had, sp specifically surrounding Jin Urso, was, you know, in the other trailers, it appears she's some, she was, she's some kind of convict. Right. You know, and it actually kind of appeared that she was or had been in trouble with the rebels themselves. And they're reading off her rap sheet and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, it feels kind of weird then they're going to trust her with something big. Like, we didn't understand the scope of the story yet. But that always felt a little weird to me. That is all answered with one shot of her in an imperial cell. Right. And then them breaking her out. And that little girl they got to play her. I understand. Like, the yeah. little girl they got to play her, perfect. Right, absolutely perfect. Well, it also played into, when we saw in some of those other trailers, you remember that little Stormtrooper doll? You're gonna 100% yes. guarantee that it's Jyn Erso's because in that <laughs> shot, she's got the little Imperial sign on her. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you go through all the books and everything too, is like the Empire Day and how all these people in these worlds looked at the Empire as a saving this race This great, thing. wonderful thing. Yeah. And then even though you look at something like, like Rebels, for people who are watching Rebels of what some of these people who are inside involved realize what it ultimately becomes. It seems like that that's transferring over into Rogue One. I saw the Empire this way. Now, it was things that my family are involved in, my father um, are involved in, I'm seeing it a different way, and now I'm going to actually be part of the rebellion. It's a, yeah. They seem to be building her story really great, and I got a lot of that in this trailer. You know, I was going to add that uh, I like that you said that the Death Star was the star of this trailer, but you know, when, it first, when the trailer first started, I felt like, man, am I going to get fatigue of the Death Star? Because that was the mm. main villain of the Force right. Awakens. Right. It was like they're kind of it was like the soft reboot star remake base, of, right, uh, right. Yeah, of Star Wars, and here we are, we have, have the Death Star again, and we already know what happens with it. So that was my fear, but I. 
I was really glad that that wasn't a wasn't didn't happen to me when I watched this version of the trailer or you know this this storyline is more about like how did the Death Star get built? Who are the people behind making the Death Star? All of them aren't evil. Obviously, Mads Mikkelsen is entwined in that in some way, maybe forced to do it. We don't know how, why he's involved in designing this, you know, planet killing device. But I mean, that that part to me is really intriguing. And also, I really like the kind of the mission. It was definitely it felt like a war film at the end where it's like there's 10 of us, but we're going to make it like it's a thousand. And, you you know, it's like we were talking about it earlier. Like I'd, I couldn't wait. I didn't know we were doing a reaction. So I saw it at 644 in the morning, like right away. Somebody's like, beep. oh, yeah, watching that on my phone. So, but, you know, to see it on a big screen, I mean, we have a nice big screen that we saw it on. That's totally flavory. So definitely, even if you saw it on your phone, watch it again when you get home. Check it out on on whatever vehicle device that you have to see it as big and as loud as possible because to me that's what was amazing about it and, and you know i totally get what you're saying about it felt like the death star itself was the star of it because there's some impressive shots not just from orbit but also that one shot from the view of the planet like looming and that yeah. looming death star coming up was impressive to me the star of the trailer was ben mendelson mm. um that was the, the kind of revelation to me now we've had a lot of him staring and brooding in the other trailers he broods so well yeah but like that one shot where he's talking to Vader, I can't remember the specific line, is like the magnitude of the power. Yeah, like right. he's he's talking to Vader like an equal in many ways. So I mean you have to assume whatever his rank is here, you gotta assume he's under Grand Moff Tarkin. Yeah. But clearly he doesn't see himself as an inferior to Vader. But that one shot, we see it on the back screen of Vader. He comes out of that mist with right. purpose. Like I don't know if he's pissed yeah. or what, or what's going on there. The space combat. One of the things I love The Force Awakens, one of the things we did not get in The Force Awakens is space combat. Other than the TIE fighter escaping right. and getting out, that, that wasn't really anything. But to see X-Wings swirling around and rebel pilots going, Whoa! like all that kind of stuff, it just sent chills down my body. Absolute chills down my body. And that closing shot, where it's the two of them running through the jungle, but you notice that those those ATST yep. feet coming right down behind them. The fact that we get to see a walker walking down the street in an urban center, firing, it's like you just felt like occupation. Like right. you just felt occupation, all that kind of stuff. I Look, I don't know if I could have asked for anything more from this trailer. This, I think, minus the nostalgia factor, and the nostalgia factor is a very good thing and a very great thing if you use it right. But minus the nostalgia factor in a couple of those Force Awakens trailers, this might be my f new favorite Star yeah. Wars trailer of the modern era, of the Force Awakens and Rogue One era. This might be my favorite trailer I've ever done. I, I got more excited. Like, pure more excited. I had more emotion watching the Force Awakens one. More pure emotion, but this was just... Absolute dynamite well, I think to me. that's because it also it, it really explores into the unknown. Now, sure, we're in the known where you're mentioning the Death Star. We know Episode Four, but this is the unknown as far as the standalones go. We don't right. know that we they've never had to rely on anything else besides the Skywalker saga before, and this is something completely different. So it's exciting as fans to watch the the universe open up a little bit more can we mention like me and uh john actually missed that overhead shot of a like a, a, a yes. fallen like ben kenobi or some jedi it looks like a bunch of rocks and and christian was like did you see that uh statue as ben kenobi we were like what are you talking about yeah. dude we watch it again we still, still missed didn't it see we it. were like what we i didn't see the where you talking about little rock is it something no 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 then you watch it again and you realize that it's a giant jedi massive yeah, jedi on the like falling down that's that overhead shot where you see a little tiny spaceship that entire massive a ship land, or a speeder going through the desert yeah. That yeah. overhead shot, I my eye just simply saw the sand and a mountain range. Right. Yeah. But he's pointing out, no, no, don't you see? Don't you see? And me yeah. and Shep are like, I, yeah. What are I you looking see? at? Yeah. yeah. And I don't. Like, I don't oh think God. that it's Kenobi because I think no, it's no, too. It's I, I think it's a Jedi for sure. Like I think it's gonna probably be on the planet Jeddah is when they yeah. first zoom in the Jeddah mm -hmm. and that's that big ass thing that that's just been for thousands of years. Right. And just you know, just it, it's symbolic too, the fallen Jedi. You know. Well, let's talk for a second about because the trailer dropped this morning, but last night. The poster dropped, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at the poster. I I love this. No, everybody knows as much as I love the Force Awakens. I was not a big fan of the official poster. Mm -hmm. Just I, I wasn't a big fan of it. Whatever. I really like this poster, and I love the way the Vader helmet is kind of, you know, uh, overlaid with the right. Death Star itself right beside Jin's face. I just I really like the poster. I love Donnie Yen on the, I think Donnie Yen is going to be like 
the hit of the movie. I think he's going to be that, you know, sometimes you get these movies where like one of the little side characters really shines. I think that's the guy who's really going to shine in this. Uh, but anyway, what do you guys think about the poster? Poster's great. And what I will say is, you know, when you after seeing the trailer, I like it even more because what we've noticed, and I think Dennis said this in the, uh, the trailer review and reaction, and I completely agree. You got that Seven Samurai, mm -hmm. Magnificent Seven feel from the trailer at certain points, and when you look at this this poster, it certainly sums that up for sure. And I do love the the silhouette of Vader, and Vader's going to be. I love what they're doing with Vader so far. I really do. And they could have they could have shown him with the with the saber. They should have they could have shown him in in battle or whatnot. But this shot of him coming out the way that they did, I think it really sets us up for what he's going to do and, and not giving us too much of him yet because you don't need it. Mm. I think that this poster really signifies what this movie's all about. Wouldn't that be weird if he never said anything just like Luke Skywalker? He's like quiet the entire movie? Nothing. That would suck. Yeah. <laughs> we know he's going to talk. We know. Well, so let conversation alone, um, the, the Krennic. I, yeah. liked, I like the poster. It reminds me of Battle Beyond the Stars. Another Seven Samurai <laughs> film. But... Um, you know, I, I don't love the poster. It's like, but I like it because they're trying something a little bit different. You yeah. know, I, there's a lot of the other Star Wars posters, especially the Drew Struzan posters, that I like more. But this is because it's got a totally different vibe. It's something new. I like that they're trying to do something new with the Star Wars mythology of the sure. posters. Hey, Wendy, you had a chance to watch the, uh, the the videos this morning. You had a chance to see the trailer. What do you think about it? Oh, I loved it 100%. I like that they're sticking with the theme and they're giving us what we've seen already, plus just a little bit more. I like seeing the relationship with uh, her or her past with Jin and her dad and what's happening with all that. And I love, love, love seeing more of Ben Mendelsohn in the trailer as well with Vader. Natasha, you sat down and watched it with us too. What did I you think? I did, yeah. I got the chills. It was so exciting. I think it's awesome for fans other than those who are really invested in Star Wars to get excited for this yeah. movie and I feel like that really translated in this trailer so I think that means huge things for Rogue One I actually have a question for Natasha too yeah. because Natasha you're, you're more like you're a casual fan yeah. of it too so when you're watching this do you were you confused at all as far as the knowing the timeline between like with Force Awakens and now this movie did you kind of do you kind of know it, where it falls in the timeline I think that's kind of hard to answer because obviously I work here, so I hear everything Star Wars <laughs> right. all the time. So I don't know <laughs> that if I was just like a general audience member just looking at this that I would really understand that. But still, I think I get the idea that, you know, it's there's a lot at stake that this story is going to be continuing Star Wars. It's different. So I think it's really exciting. I can't wait for it. All right. Let's move on to the next topic. Okay, well, a movie I am super excited for also is Disney's Mulan. Disney is actively looking to fill the director's chair for their Mulan adaptation with an Asian filmmaker, and one name in particular has serviced who reportedly turned down the movie. In a report from THR about dueling Mulan adaptations, both at Sony and Disney, the trade mentioned that Life of Pi director Ang Lee was approached by Disney but passed on the movie. Disney is now moving quickly to find a director as well as launching a global search to find a Chinese lead actress and love interest interest. Christian, what do you think about Ang Lee passing on Mulan? A uh, bit of a bummer. I I think he would have made, because I, I love Life of Pi, and obviously Crouching Tiger, and I think visually it would have been a spectacle. It would have been epic to see his version of this movie. I think he would have been the a great director, a great choice for it. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit bummed that he turned it down. I don't think it's doomed because he's not doing it. I think they can certainly find there's a lot of cool visual directors out there that can make this this work, and I think that they will find the right fit for it. And also, I'm encouraged that they went after a guy like Ang Lee because th their heads are in the right place. They they're going after the right visionary to to tell this tale. So. It's a bit disappointing that he said no, but I also think that we're going to get the right person for the job just from who they're going for on this list. What do you think, Schnapp? Yeah, I mean, Ang Lee's an incredible director. Uh, he was able to really knock it out of the park with Life of Pi. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little disappointed, but there's there's a, a, thousands of different directors that they could go to, but you're right. that They're going to someone who is cr as creative as Ang Lee with Mulan that you know hopefully we'll see their next choice is just as creative, you know? It's hard to tell who they're gonna go for, but yeah. Uh, the thing was, you know, when I heard about Ang Lee doing it, the possibility of him doing it, it felt like a little bit of a missed opportunity when, when they said he was he had the chance and he turned it down. Both a missed opportunity, I think, for the movie itself and a little bit of a missed opportunity for him too. Look, he's doing just fine. But we've seen him, was it Red Cliffs? 
that he did? Was was that his kind of epic that he did? I think it was Red Cliffs that Ang Lee did. Actually, Wendy, can you look that up for me? I think that that was the one, the name of it that I remember. And she's got this incredible, grand, epic kind of scale to it. Um, and you know, it just would have been such a good fit. But you're right. Just because he's not attached, and that would have been a great thing, that doesn't mean there aren't other great fits out there. It doesn't mean there aren't other directors out there who won't have a great vision and won't bring something magnificent to it. But yeah, I, I admit, I was a little kind of, a, a little bit of wind out of my sails when I heard, like, we could have got Ang Lee directing mm. this movie. That would have been absolutely amazing. All right, what's next? Okay, next we have opening this week. So oh. our first movie opening this week is Max Steel. Teenager Max McGrath, played by Ben Winchell, discovers that his body can generate the most powerful energy in the universe. Steel, played by Josh Brenner, is a funny, slightly rebellious, techno-organic extraterrestrial who wants to utilize Max's skills. When the two meet, they combine together to become Max Steel, a superhero with unmatched strength on Earth. And we also have Kevin Hart, What Now? Comic Kevin Hart performs his stand-up routine in front of 50,000 people at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. I am not that interested in either, to, to be honest with you. Now, here's the thing. Kevin Hart's last stand-up comedy movie, I believe it was called Laugh at My Pain, was actually really good. I mean, he, uh, you know what? I'm actually a big fan of Kevin Hart's stand-up comedy. I think he's an incredibly funny guy. And when you look past that, ah, the little guy who yells, when you right. look past that facade of him, he actually touches on a lot of really true human experiences and he just presents it in his way in such a way that I find myself really taken in by him not just as somebody who tells jokes but as a storyteller in the context of his jokes I think he's really entertaining the problem and this is the one thing that makes me a little iffy about this new film of his is that in Laugh at My Pain I think if I remember it right both at the beginning and at the end of the film he throws in these pre-scripted skits do you remember those yeah. like, that are awful they're all in the trailer too, a lot of them. Are, yeah, yeah, they're just terrible. And I, like, I walked out feeling like, you know, Eddie Murphy, when he did Raw, he didn't feel like he had to do some pre-produced skits first before or after the film. Like, I, I just wish that the movie had just been, had started with, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Hart. Right. And Kevin Hart comes on stage, does what he does so well, and then the movie ends. And I get a little bit nervous when half the trailer of this new one of him is him doing like James Bond-esque skits with Halle Berry, and I love Halle Berry and all that kind of stuff, but it kind of diminishes my excitement for it. If it had just been all a trailer of just him telling certain parts of his jokes, I probably would have been more excited. Max Steele, I, look, I just have the feeling the studio doesn't believe in the film. They've marketed it this much. You know, they barely put any notification out for the film. They haven't done anything to put it in front of people's faces. And so that just kind of gives me the feeling that they don't believe in it. So if they don't believe it, why should I believe in it? Now watch, it's going to turn out to be the surprising <laughs> big hit. I'm not sure. But are you looking forward to either one of these? That's funny because you mentioned Max Steel, and I, I almost even the even the poster feels like it was made by the Asylum, and it just like showed up on Netflix, like you know, or maybe even Hulu as like a you know, oh, we got this these thirty movies as a bundle for five bucks, and Max Steel is one of them. That's kind of what it it looks. It just looks cheap to me, like a bad knockoff of The Giver. Not you know, I know it was based on a toy line. Um, so who knows what they're going to be doing with Max Steel, but you're right. There's really, the promotion of it has been horrible. They're just kind of silently releasing it, what is what it feels like. But uh, because of all this horrible, bad promotion, now I really want to see it. Because I have that, like, it could just suck really bad. Like, uh, what was that, Seventh Son? Oof. You know, or it yeah, could be like yeah. a kind of a fun mashup mistake kind of thing. But now I actually kind of want to see Max Steel. What now, I agree with you. I. I I didn't even realize it was a concert film because all the commercials I had seen were shot like, you know, a film. So I was like, what is this new Kevin Hart film that just, you know, he was just in another film like Central Intelligence. He's got another one coming out and people are like, no, it's a it's a, you know, a live show with him in front of an audience of 50,000 people. It's like, where's that in the trailers that I've seen? And then I just saw a recent trailer with, yeah, he's out on stage. And so to me, it's very confusing, at least the way they've been marketing it. I'm like, is it a movie or is it a, is a stand up? It's some hybrid. But, you know, I mean, I think Kevin Hart's really funny. I don't know if I want to go pay money to see this stand up routine or just wait till it's on Netflix. What do you think, Christian? Uh, yeah, I'm not really interested in either one. But if I if I was forced to watch one, I'd probably be, it would be what now. But to be fair, Eddie Murphy actually did do skits in Raw. It was a it was a pre-produced one with the little kid to in the beginning. Like, and he kicked them in the ding ding when it showed like it was like a little. I don't remember it that. It was a little mini movie about Eddie Murphy as a kid telling jokes in front of his family and stuff too. That there was little <laughs> and then and then for Delirious it was him on the tour bus kind of going there was. I remember the delirious one yeah it was a little yeah. vignette it wasn't really more but this is times 20 of that but 
Kevin Hart for me, I'm not. I don't hate on Kevin Hart because it's fun to hate on Kevin Hart anymore. I do believe that he does the same shtick over and over again, but I do find him entertaining and enjoyable. I'm just not a particular fan of his stand-up. It's just not my brand of humor. But I think he's an entertaining guy, and I think that if if you're a fan of his, this could be something that could be fun. I don't care about Max Steel. I agree with Schnapp 100%. It looks like a bargain bin thing. Like it looks, you, you walk through. Uh, you know, a uh, target and you're like, why are they charging $35 for Max Steel? <laughs> uh, so I, I don't care about this movie. It, it, if it's fun and, and it works out to be good and people are saying, you'll be surprised, I'll absolutely be open-minded and check it out. But I think it's, it's like you said, no marketing behind it. It's open. I might take the bullet for you guys and I'll let, let us you know. know. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I'm Because I know nothing about it because they haven't marketed it, I am kind of curious. Me, you, and I Zen, am, should you go see it this weekend? Yeah, yeah, yeah I totally have to go in to go see it. Yeah. I want to give it a chance. And by the way, guys, before we move on in the next segment, I want to point out, I said that Ang Lee directed Red Cliffs. It's actually John Woo. I was going to uh, say John Woo, but I was Yeah, it was John sure, Woo. Yeah. So I, I don't know why I got those confused, but just so let's not be misinformed. All right, guys, it is that time of the show now for Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Natasha, what do we got? One of the year's most acclaimed and profitable horror films this year was Fede Alvarez's Don't Breathe. The film has made Alvarez one of Hollywood's most sought-after directors, and now, according to The Hollywood Reporter, he's signed on to the upcoming comic book film Incognito. The movie will be produced by Sony Pictures and tells the story of Zack Overkill, a supervillain who is in witness protection after testifying against a powerful hero, the Black Death. Though required to take a drug that eliminates his superpowers and work a boring male job, Zack becomes restless and finds a way to regain his powers, forcing him to decide whether to use them again or stay in the safety of his regular job. A release date has not been set. Schnapp buy or sell an incognito movie directed by Fede Alvarez. Man, when I heard this news, I instantly started sweating because I love <laughs> Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. <clears throat> everything they do, from criminal to fatal, to every, every single comic book that they've done is just unbelievably amazing. And Incognito falls into that category. Once again, it's a really great story. It's definitely film noir meets superheroes. It's so much fun to get someone like Fede Alvarez to direct it, especially after seeing Don't Breathe. I just was like, oh my God, what an incredible winning combination. If you haven't checked out Incognito, it's available in trade paperbacks. I highly suggest getting it. It's an incredible story, incredible artwork, and now they've got an incredible director. So. I, when does it come out? Tomorrow? Come on, make this thing. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I'm a big buy for me. First of all, what Brubaker and Phillips did with that story is it's it's hard to do something that feels like it fits within the genre, yet feels original at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Incognito is one of those things that does that. Adding Fede Alvarez. I mean, look what he just did with, with Don't Breathe. That movie, he made that movie for, I think it was just a hair under $10 million. Wow. He made that movie. It's made now over $140 million. Ooh. And it's not just, okay, because it made money. It's a great film. What he was able to do, telling his story with just a couple of characters in one confined space, amazing mm -hmm. what he did. And I really like what he did with his Evil Dead take mm -hmm. as well. Actually, you can check out on our YouTube channel, you can do a quick search for our own Perry Nimeroff who did an interview with Fede recently here in studio, so check that out. But I, yeah, I think this is just sounds fantastic. For me, it's a big buy, what do you think? It's a big buy for me for a lot of different reasons. A lot of the reasons that you guys are saying, but a few other ones, I think that first of all, he's sought out talent for obviously making a really good movie, but making the studio a lot of money for that. Doing a unique tale, yeah, sure, a lot of comic book movies are being made now, but doing newer comic books and showing how many different kind of varied stories there are in comic books that are not just the typical Marvel, DC stories. These are different stories. That the, the creative storytelling that there's so many comic book artists that are doing to bring that to life and having an artist like Fetty Alvarez doing that is, is really interesting. Um, I also, one of the big buys for me is the way he is shaping his career what he's doing with his career. This is how you become great as a director. Meaning, you start off with like uh, the remake of Evil Dead and you get your name out there. And I also enjoyed the Evil Dead remake. I think that a lot of the hardcore fans were against it because it doesn't have that humor yeah. that the first Evil Dead it's did. It's Evil Cabin and it's really good. It's, yeah, that, that's what it is. It, <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 a very, it's different. So purists didn't like it, but I, th I don't think you can take away from what he did as a filmmaker. Then you look at um, Don't Breathe and what he's done there. And now by shifting over a little bit different here into the comic book world and adding his touch, you it automatically if it's good if this one is good it automatically says to you as a fan what's next 
What's yeah. next, Fede? What are you going to do next? Well, that, that gets a great director, the fan base of, oh, I want to see it. It's another Fede Alvarez movie. What is he going to do next? Honestly, I mean, if you haven't read Incognito, I highly say check it out because it is such a well-written story and it's so well-drawn and the visuals are just there for Fetty. I mean, at, when, you, at, when you see Don't Breathe and you, then you see the visuals for Incognito, it is a perfect fit. All right, what's next? After a special IMAX screening of 15 minutes of Doctor Strange, Marvel's head honcho Kevin Feige fielded a question about Kate Beckinsale's comments that a potential crossover between Underworld and Blade had been considered and abandoned because they're doing something with Blade. Feige then said that the Underworld producers did approach the studio about a potential crossover, but Marvel said no. Feige added, between the movies, the Netflix shows, the ABC shows, there are so many opportunities for the character to pop up, as you're now seeing with Ghost Rider on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., that Rather than team up with another studio on that character, let's do something on our own. He continued, what that is, where that will be, we'll see. There's nothing imminent to my knowledge. John, buy or sell a Blade movie ever happening at Marvel Studios? Um, ever is a tough word. Ever is a really tough word. In the foreseeable future, sell. Ever, you got to have some new material at some point. So ever, I'll go buy. But what I really buy is Kevin Feige's mindset here. You know what? Yeah, okay, there might you might be doing a little bit of fan service by taking Blade, crossing it over with Underworld. Sure, in a Elseworlds kind of mentality, there's something kind of cool story to tell. But Feige is incredibly protective of this world that he's created. And he understands, we cross this over with Underworld all of a sudden, we're just opening ourselves up for a lot of potential problems down the road mm -hmm. when, when it comes to continuity and whatever. And unlike Fox, and there's a lot of the Fox films I absolutely love, but we like said, what's Fox's mantra? Continuity, schmontinuity. They really don't care if one film contradicts another. It doesn't matter. Kevin Feige and the Marvel Cinematic Universe do care. It's important to them. So I really like his approach. I like his philosophy on this. So yeah, overall for me, it's a buy. Schnapp, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'm going to buy it. But I, I think that to, when he said, to my knowledge, uh, is he saying he doesn't work in the TV world anymore. And it's yeah. a sly way of him... You know, saying I don't know anything about Blade, but I honestly feel like Blade. Look, they don't. Blade doesn't need Underworld because Blade already has a vampire in the world that it's called Morbius. So they can have the Midnight Suns with Ghost Rider, with Blade, with uh, if they wanted to have Morbius, Werewolf by Night. They've got a whole you know supernatural division of Marvel, which with Ghost Rider being part of Agents of Shield, they're opening that brand up on ABC and obviously they were like talking about having Ghost Rider become its own series next year because of the fan response and the viewer response to the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. with Ghost Rider in it. Um, I see them introducing Blade, I see them introducing Werewolf by Night. The entire supernatural aesthetic will fit really well into the ABC world, not so much into the Netflix world. So I see Blade working really well as a TV show or at least being introduced, if not in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., in the Ghost Rider series that they're probably going to do next year. So it's not going to be the Marvel Cinematic World that Kevin is in charge of, but I'm glad that he said no to mixing it up with yeah. other outside Marvel brands because you don't need it. Marvel has all of those uh, entities inside its own universe. So, you know, they've fought so hard to get all these characters back. They're not going to start selling them off anytime soon. Yeah, I don't think it was a stupid idea. Like, if you bring up the idea, Crossing Underworld with Blade, that's a conversation no, worth sure. having. It's worth having that conversation. I don't think it was a stupid idea on either party's right. part, but I think it's the right move to look at it and to go, not for us. What do you think, Christian? What a fun layered story this is all the way around, though, too. <laughs> just because, look, I'm going to sell that it's it's ever going to be a movie. I don't think it will ever be a movie for Marvel. I mean, 20, 30 years, who the hell knows? But right. in, like within the next 10 or 15 years, no, I don't see it being a movie. I do think it's perfect for television. I do not battle your comic book knowledge as far as when you, you start talking about the inside with the shield and everything, too. I actually hope it's a Netflix series. If you say it's more likely that it's going to be on ABC, I, I trust your judgment, but I, I happen to think that it would fit better as far as my liking on a Netflix series because of what it's proved that it did in the first two Blade movies mm -hmm. anyway, how that rated R kind of feel just fit the tone for Blade. So I would prefer to see it. But I'm with you. I would no, prefer. No, I know. I, I would just think it's more realistic. I want it to be on Netflix myself. I would love to see all of those supernatural characters in their own Netflix universe. But it feels like once they open that door with Ghost Rider, it felt like, oh, they're going to. He's gonna, part of a universe yeah. that's already. He, he Let probably us not forget, too. There was a Blade TV series with right. Sticky Fingers. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, there was. And you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit it. 
It was a little bit of a guilty pleasure of mine. It was hey, on man. Spike, right? Sticky Fingers is awesome. Yeah. So, I, I, mean, I can't remember what network it was yeah. on, but I got a little bit of a kick yeah. out of that out of that show. I did. But all that stuff. You know what? I also, who I also want to give because Sony does Underworld, right? Yes. I want to give credit to Sony here because Sony had, had the smarts to say, "Let's let's approach. We got a relationship here with Marvel. Let's approach right. them. Let's see." Sony let's, and Lakeshore, I believe. Yeah. Let's see what we yeah. can do. Let's 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 give it a shot because that to me that franchise is almost dead. I thought the last trailer was terrible. It was the same thing over and over mm-hmm. and over again, the same crap we've been seeing. So to, for them trying to get some juice behind it and putting Blade in it, I thought right. it was a smart idea. It just, you know, you take a shot. It didn't work out. And also kudos to Marvel saying, we don't need to do that right now, but thank you for knocking on the door. Let us know if there's something else you want to see. So overall, really dug this story all the way through. I hope it becomes a Netflix series because I think it would, that tone fits it. But I tend to agree with Schnapp, I think, because they can stick them in a universe that's already working. It'll probably happen over at ABC. All right, what's next? The first clip has been released for Jurassic World 2 Helmer J.A. Bayona's A Monster Calls. The movie tells the story of Connor, played by Lewis McDougall, a 12-year-old boy who's dealing with his dying mother, played by Felicity Jones, his cold grandmother, played by Sigourney Weaver, his distant father, played by Toby Kebbell, and the bullies at school. In his hour of need, he inadvertently summons a monster to help him, voiced by Liam Neeson. A Monster Calls opens in limited release on December 23rd, followed by a wide release on January 6th. Christian Byer sell the new clip from A Monster calls well i'm gonna cheat and definitely say that i buy it because i've seen the movie um (laughs) and i know this scene and i loved this scene and i love the movie so this sets exactly the tone of what you're about to see with the with the monster it's got a it's a less it's a a less it's a it's not as dark as pan's labyrinth but it certainly has that feel for sure i love this movie thought it was great thought it was visionary uh, a visionary director who, who really took hold of this told a nice story a lot of emotion behind it and this is a cool clip yeah for me it's it's a big buy too and you know uh, director jay bayona was actually here in studio do we is that video up yet the, the interview not yet but keep your eye open on collider video uh we just had him in studio here yesterday director jay bayona about this this is a movie that the first trailer dropped i thought this looks silly but then all my friends who have seen it already, I have not yet, are telling me this is going to be a contender for best picture of the year. And so, and, the, and then when you watch this spot, it just kind of feeds into that. For me, it's a big buy. Yeah, I buy the spot too. I mean, the, the second, I think it was the second trailer, I, it hit me, it got me emotional. I felt like, am I gonna cry? It's like, so, you know, I, I almost saw it last night. I had to do a bunch of artwork, but I cannot wait to see this movie. It's, it's really, everyone telling me it's, it's their top 10 film of the year. It's in the top 10. The clip shows that everything about the trailer shows me it's got that emotional, you know, response there. So I, yeah, I think it's uh, it look, it looks great. And by the way, if you want to pull in the wide shot here, like you'd be forgiven for saying that does look like, you know, Groot's crusty old dad. It it, it, it does, and that's the right. first thing that struck me. But you know what? It it just works to beautiful, beautiful effect. All right, folks, listen. We do this show live, which means at the end of the show, we're going to save a few minutes to take some of your live Twitter questions. Just follow us on Twitter at Collider Video, and you can start tweeting in those questions right now. And Wendy will pick a few out to read off at the end of the show. But also want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video today. A little bit later today. We've got uh, a show with nothing to talk about. Jedi Council drops at 5 p.m. a little bit later today. Keep your eyes open for that. And also tomorrow, a big movie trivia showdown we've been looking forward to. Olympic gold medalist Cody Miller taking on JT Eve, little evil himself. Keep your eyes open for that. And also, keep your eyes open on our Collider Video channel throughout the day for any breaking news stories that we have coming later on. For now, it's time for us to get to the mailbag. Remember, if you've got a question you want asked on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Natasha, what do we got in the mailbag? Okay, Josh writes, I have recently been thinking and wondering what separates Disney's live action and animation come Oscars. For example, will the Jungle Book, if nominated, be nominated as a live action for having one human character? This also goes to the upcoming The Lion King live action. If nominated, will it be animation or live action sci-fi having no human characters? Where does the line between live action begin and end come Oscars? Well, if we're gonna get to, we talked about this a little bit before, but getting to the specific question, if a movie like Jungle Book gets nominated for Best Picture, which I do not think it will. As of right now, it's in my top 10 of the year, but we're about to get into some really great films, so it might get bumped out. I love Jungle Book a lot. So for argument's sake, if it was nominated, could it be nominated for Best Animated? I think the answer to that is no. I think the Oscars have, the Academy has a lot of figuring out to do about where does that line get drawn as it is. If your lead character in the film is a live action performer, 
then they'll probably take, and I think rightfully so, disqualify that from calling it an animated film per se. It's a film with a lot of animation, a lot of visual effects, absolutely. But can you call it an animated film purely with a lead character that's live action? I don't think you can. With The Lion King, it really all depends. If they go all CG, then by definition it falls under the category of um, of animated. So I, it's, it depends on how you look at it. Christian, how do you see it? I don't know because it's also tricky too because here's a question. Because if it's all performance capture, right, Does is that qualifying as animation though too? Because if that's the case, if there was not one human character in War of the Planet of the Apes, we know that there are. But if there weren't, is that animation film? I think so. Really? I think so, yeah. See, I think it's, I don't know how it qualifies. I, I'm just, I'm baffled. motion capture is just Performance capture and motion are different the, the Performance capture and motion capture, those are just methods of inputting the animation of the digital character you see on screen. It's just a change of the method, but it's still the medium of animation, you know what I mean? See, I think a lot of performance uh, capture, people would argue that though, because I think the actual, like, when you look at, even if you're looking, uh, you and I have had countless sure. conversations about this with, with Andy Serkis, with the, the actual, when you see Caesar, and, and I'm not taking anything away from the actual animators mm. themselves and people who are putting the, the visual effects on them because they're doing a phenomenal job there, but the facial expressions and things that you see there inside of it is actually Andy Serkis and all those things. Now when you do something like Warcraft, when they're just designing and on uh, motion capture, the animation just goes completely kind of over them for the right. most part. And you're not getting the same kind of thing that you are with the performance capture. So it, it's a tri it's a weird, but then, it's a weird but thing. Why would you just ask us, the, the basic question is, what's the medium? Yeah, I know. I, I don't not know. Do I don't know the answer. Not how do get to the medium, but what is the medium? I have no it's, idea. What do you think, Schnapp? We're in a really, uh, we're like, we're approaching what would be called the uncanny valley of awards yeah. systems because uncanny valley is when, when does it not a human or, or is it an animation? Right. And can you tell? Uh, we're getting to that point where you can't tell if it's a human or not. We've, we've seen countless, uh, in, you know, face replacements of characters and stunts that you'd never know weren't those actual actors. It was a stuntman, but they just CG'd out their face. That stuff works from far away. It's a harder, like if you saw Civil War, you saw the the super young Robert Downey Jr. It looked really good up until a little bit towards the end, but then it was okay because it was all CG anyway as the older Robert Downey Jr. took over, so you knew it was a fake thing. Um, with something like Jungle Book, it'd be very interesting to see the entire movie with no effects like just green screen and that kid, and that then you'd be, be, you'd be able to quantify, you'd be able to say, it is 97% special effects, i.e. animated. Then you'd be like, well, then it should be in the animated category because if you take out all the shots of everything, there's a tree stump and here's a leaf and here's a, a small part of water that they use, but everything else, over 97% of every shot that you see is fake. Like even that background, that's all completely fake except for the kid yeah. and maybe the tree stump that he's sitting on. That's a kind of a crazy thing that we're gonna be approaching, especially because of a movie like Jungle Book or a movie like Lion King, where it's gonna be a lot of voice actors. And like what you're talking about is Andy Serkis is definitely, he's a one of a kind right now. Like when you have performance capture, when you see all these characters walking around, they didn't performance capture Christopher Walken with a bunch of buttons on him. Well, that's the difference between motion and performance. Well, what I'm saying is yeah. they captured his face. I'm sure they did all the dots with his face, or maybe they just did it in, in studio. It's hard to tell. I didn't do enough background research on Jungle Book to know whether they just recorded. Maybe they filmed him and then anima had animators look at his face. Easier way now is to do all the dots because it records that facial motion. Right. But maybe the actor who played the monkey is a different actor. Like a younger guy could do a bunch of crazy jumpy sprints and stuff. So it's a combination of different kinds of actors now who are feeding that information into the computer graphics. And then there's an animator also tweaking that. And there's all these different levels of, as we know, CG, you're like, you have the model, then you have the fur, then you have the lighting, then you have the mouth bag, the rigs and all this, all these other, every single character goes through like at least 10 different animators, like a pass until it gets to the animation director and then they give it. So it's this entire process, yeah. which is a lot of work. I mean, was, is just animation, we've taken it out of, it's not even cell animation anymore that's nominated for an animated film. Most of it, there's almost no cell animation done anymore. It's all CG, it's all computer graphics. So those are the films that are gonna be up for nomination this year. Jungle Book, I would argue, is CG, is computer graphics. 97% of it is Mowgli is the only human, there, and then there's his dad, there's the flashback scene. So there's a couple of humans in it. There's when he gets to the village, things like that. But boy, it's a, it's gonna be a tough one to argue, and we're gonna find it even harder to argue in another year when Lion King comes so out. Even just at this table, we have three very different opinions. Mm -hmm. Like my, the, to, to me, the medium is animation, but the method of which you feed in the 
the process of how that me that medium moves becomes a different thing. We mm -hmm. all disagree, so how can we expect the Academy right, at this point right. to have any agreement? But Natasha, you saw Jungle Book. Did you, you, understanding that most of it all is all digital other than Mowgli, do you consider it an animated film or a live action film? Look, animation or live action Jungle Book was amazing and it needs to be nominated. I don't care what category you put <laughs> it in, I loved it. It's one of my favorite movies of this year. I mean, there is so much intricate work in there. I, I mean, I don't know technical stuff at all, but I mean, that looked like real life. So I say live action. <laughs> all right, let's move on. What's the last mailbag question today? Okay, our last mailbag question is from Miles Smith, and he writes, I read in the news recently that Michael Jackson is the highest earning dead celebrity with $825 million. This got me thinking, do you think we will ever see a Michael Jackson biopic? Yeah, we, ta <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this a few, uh, maybe a year or two ago, we talked about this, and it's still a pressing question. The idea of a Michael Jackson biopic is fascinating. Like you cannot understate how important this guy was to music. At the same time, what approach do you take to telling his story? Do you just tell the story of his amazing birth into the music industry and rise to becoming the king of pop and forego the darker, shadier kind of stuff that they look at? Do you make a movie that does focus on the darker, shady, shadier allegations or not? It's a tough one to call. If I'm a studio head, I'm like, I, I, okay, we got the rights to make a Michael Jackson movie, great. What Michael Jackson movie do we make? And I have a feeling that eventually it'll happen, but I think they're gonna wanna put maybe another five to 10 years between the passing of Michael Jackson and when they actually try to put one together. Um, I, I just don't know how you approach the film. That's the tough part. I'm interested in it. I just don't know how you approach it. Make a trilogy. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's gonna happen for sure. I think it'll actually I think it'll happen probably in the next five years. But it, it'll it'll happen, and should it happen, absolutely. I mean, it's funny because I was there's a Michael Jackson song that popped on on the way here, and it's just you can't help listen. Mm -hmm. It's he's just one of the best musicians of all time, regardless of what you what you think about. Right. It was a conversation what we had yesterday, the same conversation with Birth of a Nation, with the mm -hmm. you separate the art from the artist, but it's also. That guy had a lot of things going on in his life with a lot of allegations and they ha they have to explore that stuff in the in the the biopic you have to you can't because if you don't if you shy away from it the controversy alone behind it would be like oh they, they painted him in this point and all and families would come out and there'd be a lot of conversation if you don't explore it you have to explore everything with him you have to t his family history the rough relationship with with joe jackson like right. all that stuff and there have been i think family movies that they have done about them in the past but nothing specifically on michael after he passed away but I would. I think it's a it's it's a movie that it needs to be told. So yeah, I think it'll happen. Yeah, most definitely. I, I would love to see a biopic that kind of that mi mixes both of those. I mean, he was the king of pop. I mean, off the wall. Any of his albums, especially from the '80s and early '90s, were incredible. I mean, he really he was a superstar. He also did a lot of great things in his life, and then he also succumbed to a lot of this horrible pressure that he was under and became kind of like, you know, you look in the mirror and this kind of weird thing that you become is like when you see celebrities go down that rabbit hole, that's what happened to him. And in really, in some ways, could be really bad ways. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of things were never proven, a lot of things were proven, so you have to ride that line with what is actually what's truth and what's fiction. but. You know, seeing a biopic about you know him as a little kid with the Jackson Five as he became a man, as he decided to you know change his face, change his look, his persona, and build that persona. I mean, that's the thing that is incredible, and it's it's a story that is waiting to be told. I'd love to see it. All right, guys. So I said near the end of the show, we would save a little bit of time, take some of your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video. Wendy, what have you picked out? Return of the Max says, quick question, do you watch every film that comes out or are you selective and avoid films you know are bad? Probably 95% of the films that come out. I mean, I think maybe one out of every 20, maybe one out of every 15, I'll go, oh, that just looks so bad. I'm going to elect to take a pass on this mm. one. I, that happens from time to time too. What about you? I, it, look, I've missed the most movies I've ever missed since I was started doing Schmoes this month and it's because things had happened oh yeah at home. you've had you know, some home stuff just yeah. stuff that had happened but i mean normally i try to catch everything and it's and a lot of people are like, well you miss so many horror movies a lot of those luckily for me are coincidental mm -hmm. like i don't shoot opt out of this i try to see everything but it sometimes it happens where i just can't see it but i try to see everything 
I'd go, I'm like 50-50. If I don't want to see a movie, I don't see it. And, you know, people are like, did you see a movie? They're like, nope, I have zero plans on seeing it. I mean, it's it. The, the film has to either sell me on the trailer or the story, and then I'll go see it. I'm like, that's, that's how I am. All right, what's next? Uh, G-Town Film says, what did you guys think of The Accountant? I know many of you saw it recently. Yeah, you know what? Going into The Accountant last night, I, I did something I shouldn't have done. I jumped on my phone to check the Rotten Tomato meter going in to see The Accountant last night. It said 40%. I'm like, oh, gosh. I loved it. I, I really, really like this film. I don't know where that 40%. Now, after last night when a bunch of more critics saw it, it's jumped up to 47. That's great. But and look, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is a top five film of the year. I'm not saying that at all. But I was really impressed with it. I thought both as kind of a little bit of a thriller was great, a little bit of a mystery is a great, and as an action film, I thought it was great. I thought Ben Affleck was fantastic in it. Um, I, What can I say? I think The Accountant's a really enjoyable movie. You saw it with me last night. What did you think? I did, and I and I went to see... I was expecting a lot from the trailers. I thought it was going to be like Affleck's Born, and it's not Born. I think it's more like his John Wick more than anything yeah. else, too. And I don't understand the 44% either because I really enjoyed it. Is it a great movie? No, I don't think it's great. I think it's good. I think it's enjoyable. And I like the storytelling device, the way that they told the story. Gavin O'Connor, I thought, and I thought Affleck was really good. There were a couple performances in there I thought were just okay. But overall, I enjoyed it. Not a great movie, but I thought it was enjoyable, and I don't understand the 44%. Now, I didn't see it, but like if I, like, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Which one is better for you guys, The Accountant or the Jason Bourne, the newest Bourne movie? The Accountant. Uh, the Accountant. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. easily. easily. The latest yeah. Bourne movie, easily The Accountant wow. to me. Okay. Wendy, you were there last night. You saw The Accountant with us. What do you think of it? I really liked it. I mean, I know it wasn't really meant to be like an action flick, but at the end of it, I kind of felt like I was watching an action, action flick with a lot of math and uh Action like, flip <laughs> a lot of math. and a i feel like <laughs> and i feel like ben affleck is like the only person that can make math look sexy and sound sexy to me yeah so he did a what really is wrong job. with all these other critics all three of you guys I, love I, it honestly, What's that? look like i i this is one of those films you know i come to out of a lot of films going hey i like this movie but i can see why people didn't yeah, like right. it or i hated this movie but i can see why I I, I don't understand what the to dislike about huh. it so much. Well, because if you look at the Rotten Tomatoes, the way that the scores work is that it's like basically if it's, if it's under if you have five point score system, if it's under three is where you get like a rotten. Yes. Yeah. I don't understand. I could see where it's like a three or over three. I don't understand how so many people undersold it at like a two point five or a two. I I personally thought even if you pushed it at like a three and said yeah, it was good. Yeah. But I was surprised. I'm surprised. Wow. That it was but so even low. with that sliding scale, I, know. I thought it still deserved. I agree with I, you. So it's interesting. Yeah. All right. Last last question of the day all right feel fem oh last question yeah oh i feel oh, like now I need the pressure is on a, 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 a a it's like make, make, a, good make it a good one, one. all right let me up. ask because it's it's i feel like it's like a star wars day around the office so let me ask this one instead um mm. christopher woodburn says are you guys disappointed that darth vader doesn't speak in the new trailer not at all no no not disappointed at all i i thought it was great all i wanted to see him was just move yeah like just that he's there save whatever look we're not going to get 30 minutes right. of Darth Vader in this movie. Okay? We're not. I understand that. I know that. So if that's the case, keep reminding us that he's there, mm. but save the stuff that he's going to say. General Mendelssohn, get out of my face. Yeah. yeah save that for the movie. I'm, I'm totally fine with it. Yeah, and I'll tell you why I didn't mind is because I know he's having a conversation with Krennic. I yeah. see Krennic talking right. to him. So we know he's in a film. And the other reason I know he's going to be talking and I know it's going to be James Earl Jones doing it is James Earl Jones is doing it for Rebels. Right. So why wouldn't you bring him back for Rogue is that, One? Is that Mendelssohn's name, Krennic? Krennic? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you're like going to Star Wars sweaty right here. I was I like, Who, uh, <laughs> yeah. who's he talking about? The General Krennic. And Blade will not be in this <laughs> movie. Uh, so yeah, I think that yeah, absolutely it's 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 totally okay that he didn't speak. I was him. a little bummed, but then I, I watched it a couple times. And I was like, you know, it's it's cool enough to see his presence there, and I and yeah, I agree with you guys. They're saving it because why not save it? It's, that's we can know he's there. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collide Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you go and watch that Rogue One trailer because it's really damn good. Uh, I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting way over there, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. My Collider Heroes is up. Check it out. It's a wrap of all the sweaty news for superheroes. And I'll be back on Movie Talk and Nightmares next week. Right beside me, Christian Harloff. Uh, it's going to be all about Jedi Council. If you go, first of all, follow me at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. But Jedi Council today, myself, John, Tiffany, and Mark Riley will break down the Rogue One trailer, the latest and greatest in Star Wars. 
Over there at that table, we've got Natasha Martinez. Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter on and Instagram at Natasha Lexus underscore. And Wendy Lee, where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and also on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to Comic-Con HQ, where John Schnepp and I do our weekly show, Film HQ, airing every Saturday. Go and check that out. And a special thanks to all the guys behind the scenes for making this possible. And a special thanks to you guys. Make sure you join us again tomorrow. My name is John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.